God's people need to take a public stand. We need to stand for Him in our place of work and in our social gatherings. That's one of the important lessons that our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, says that we'll learn as we study the life of King Hezekiah here on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and we begin in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 at verse 5. But before we do get started, let's take a mini tour through Central Europe and hear from our fellow listeners there. First is a note from a listener in Poland. Through your broadcast, the Holy Spirit has taken a hold of my life and changed me completely. It didn't happen without a struggle. But when I realized how great and strong Jesus' love is, I surrendered. Jesus has sustained me in more difficult moments when I struggled with my old bad nature. I praise him for this victory. The Holy Spirit has taught me humility, patience, the ability to make good decisions, and he has helped me to get rid of my wrong ego. And then here's a listener. This is from Albania. I am a new believer. I began to listen to your radio program because a friend told me about your programs. I began to listen to it on a regular basis. It's amazing. When I first came to Christ, I was overwhelmed by the Bible, but your teaching makes it easier to understand. Each broadcast encourages me to learn more. Next, we have a listener of our Serbian language broadcasts who recently wrote this. We're so grateful for your teaching. Our church does not have a pastor, so your teachings help us to understand the truth about God's Word and stay on track. There are a lot of false teachings, and your messages help us to be able to recognize them. Thank you. And then finally, we hear from a listener of our Romanian broadcasts. I tried to read the Bible as a teenager, but there were so many things I didn't understand, so I gave up. About five years ago, through an illness, I lost my sight, and that's when I found your program by accident. Now I listen to it all the time. I have found that understanding the Word of God is very important to me. I am 34 years old and now believe that God can use me even if I am blind. I am grateful to Him for a wonderful wife and a six-year-old daughter. Please pray that I will be a good spiritual leader for them. Well, what terrific letters. You know, our World Prayer Team is traveling on their knees through Central Europe this week, and we'd love to have you join us as we pray for these listeners and millions of others around the world. Why don't you sign up to receive our specific prayer requests and praises at ttb.org forward slash pray. And now let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you bring clarity to our hearts and minds as we study your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come back today to a portion of the word of God that we continually remind you doesn't seem to be very interesting, and yet it to my judgment, it's a very thrilling portion in all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable to us for very many reasons. Now, last time we were looking at King Ahaz. We saw that he was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. David was the human standard, and this man fell far short of that human standard. And as a result, we now begin to see the sad future of the southern kingdom. Already the northern kingdom has gone into captivity in Assyria. Now God is giving a warning to the southern kingdom that they likewise will fall into captivity not to Assyria, it was to Babylon later on. Now I read it, verse 5. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who smote him with a great slaughter. 
Now, God opens up the doors, as it were, to his nation, to his people, and permits the enemy to come in. Syria now has come down, and for the first time, why, the wall is breached into the southern kingdom, and many are taken captive. Now, the sad part was that the northern kingdom had joined with Syria in making this attack, And we find that many had been taken into captivity of the southern kingdom by the northern kingdom. That is, Israel had taken Judah into captivity. Now, will you note, for Pekah the son of Remaliah slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers." And Zechariah, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maaseiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought the spoil to Samaria." Now, this is a very sad plight for the southern kingdom. And God permitted it because of the fact of the sin of Ahaz. And the people had plunged into idolatry in a very real way. Now, God sends a prophet to speak to Israel because of their extreme cruelty to their brethren. Verse 9, But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up into heaven. And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you, But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? You see, God had forbidden that, actually. God did not permit this to take place at all. And he said that they were never to take their brethren into slavery. Verse 11, Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren. For the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim. Now, we have quite an exercise in pronunciation here. But a group of the leaders now, they stood up against them that came from the war and said unto them, Ye shall not bring in the captives hither. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up, took the captives, and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them, and arrayed them and shod them, and gave them to eat and to drink, and anointed them, and carried all the feeble of them upon asses, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. Now you see, having taken their own brethren, this great company into captivity, they had evil thoughts of making them slaves. Now, God told them that they cannot do that. This prophet said, The judgment of God and the wrath of God is upon you because of this. And I said a moment ago that the northern kingdom had gone into captivity. They were on the verge of going into captivity, and they went in, by the way, at this particular juncture. And this, of course, is one of the things that contributed to the fact God permitted them to go into captivity. Captivity was the treatment they gave of their brethren. Now, Judah was actually in a very sad plight at this time. And if it had not been for the fact that God intervened, they would almost have been eliminated as a nation at this time. 
And this, of course, weakened them a great deal and laid them open to further invasion. And so what you have now in the rest of this chapter is this. At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. For again the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. You see, God just opened the floodgates now and let the enemy come in because of their sin. And actually, wars are the result of sin. James asked, you remember the question, why are there wars among you? Well, there are a great many answers to that question today, of course. Why are there wars among us? From whence come wars and fightings among you? And then he answers it. Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your member? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have. Now, as long as there's sin in the heart of man, he can't have peace. He can't have any kind of peace. Peace with God, peace in his own heart, and peace with his fellow man. There must be the settling of this sin question. And so, because of the sin of these people, they'll not have peace. And they made a big mistake. Ahaz, instead of turning to God, he turned to Assyria and rested in Assyria. And as a result, why, Assyria let them down. Assyria did not make their treaty good. And you can't expect nations to make their treaties good. And somebody says, why not? Well, very simply, as long as you've got men that are sinners, that means they're liars. And that means that you cannot trust them. Put not your trust in man. Isaiah warned us of that. God warns us of that. And we're to put our trust in God. Now, Ahaz put his trust in the king of Assyria, and Assyria let him down. He had sent over a generous offering. He actually personally took wealth out of the palace and sent it to the king. The king accepted it, but he never sent any help, and he didn't have to because he was a powerful king, and poor Ahaz is now a very weak king. And as a result, there comes in the enemy again, and many are taken captive. So this ends the very sad and sordid and sorry reign of Ahaz. Verse 26, Now the rest of his acts, and of all his ways, first and last, behold, they're written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers. They buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now we come to Hezekiah, and here we have one of the five periods of revival that came to this nation. Now, you would think that after this period of Ahaz, there'd be no hope for that nation. They were depleted of their resources. They had been at war. They had been betrayed. And you would think that there was no help at all for them. Well, Hezekiah came to the kingdom, I think, for such a time as this, because he's God's man. Notice verse 1 of chapter 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. He reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. Now, his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. Now, you see that his mother and his grandfather are mentioned here, but not his father. His father's old Ahaz. And apparently he had a godly mother. Apparently he had a godly grandfather. And that influenced this young man, Hezekiah. Now we are told he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. Now we've talked about him before when we were back in Second Kings and we were told at that time back in Second Kings 18.5 he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. Now, here is a man that is outstanding. When you begin with David and you come down through the list of all 20 of the kings that 
followed, well, 21 kings with Solomon, that followed David, there's not one of them that can equal Hezekiah. He's the outstanding one, and there were several great men and men that turned to God. Now, this man Hezekiah led in, I think, probably one of the greatest revivals. And we've had it in Second Kings. We have it here now in Second Chronicles, here in the 29th chapter and the 30th chapter. And we'll follow through with it into the 31st chapter. And then we'll go into the 32nd chapter. And all of this is about Hezekiah. And we've said that Chronicles is God's viewpoints, what God takes delight in. Evidently, God took great delight in Hezekiah. And then when we get to Isaiah the prophet, you will find out in the center of his book of Isaiah, there are several chapters that are historical, not prophetic. And they have to do, well, you guessed it, with Hezekiah. Three times in the Word of God, we're told about this man And friends, he led in a great revival, and I think probably one of the greatest revivals. And they did have several great revivals. Now, there was in the revival that he had a negative side. It's not in Chronicles for the very simple reason. This is God's viewpoint. This is seeing it as God sees it, and God is noticing the positive side. And now, what was the negative side? Well, the negative side was just simply this, that these people had gone into idolatry. The temple was closed up, and they did have there that brazen serpent that Moses, you know, had made, and they'd kept it there. And now they were beginning to worship it. And we're told here, you have to go back to Second Kings 18, verse 4 to get this. It says, he removed the high places broke the images, cut down the groves, break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehustan. Now, what does that mean? That means, well, it's just brass. It's nothing. So that the first thing that he did was this. He got rid of this thing that was a stumbling block because that which had been Actually, the basis of salvation for Israel at one time now becomes an object of worship. It becomes an idol, a stumbling block to the people. But it's just brass. That's all it was, just Christmas jewelry. And there are those today that worship the symbol of the cross. They feel like there's some merit in having a cross around. Friends, there's no merit in the cross, even if you had the original one. Wouldn't be any merit in it at all. This man here, he was a great man of God, friends. You can bow down. I mean, you can worship, actually, you can worship in the kitchen. You could worship the spigot because it gives you water. You could worship the window because you could give it credit for light. You could worship your stove because it furnishes warmth and heat. And you could worship the automobile. May I say to you, a great many people today worship a television screen. They bow down to it several times during the day. My friend, may I say to you, there's no merit in objects. The merit is in God, of course. And that's the important thing. And so he got rid of that which was a stumbling block. But now there's the positive side, and we're told here what he did. Verse 3, he in his first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, they had nailed to the doors of the temple. Nobody was using it. Ahaz had had it closed up. But now this man opens them up for the first time over a long period of time. And now they begin to clean everything up. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east gate. And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. And believe me, friends, that was quite a thing. There was return to holy living. 
to honesty and to integrity. And that was something that was needed. We've got too much of this homogenized Christianity today. Just mix everything together. And then will you notice many other things here that was to be confession. Our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They've forsaken him. They've turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, turned their backs. Also, they've shut up the doors of the porch, put out the lamps, have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place under the God of Israel. You see, they had deserted God altogether. Now, notice what this man Hezekiah does. Verse 20, Then Hezekiah the king rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. He set a pretty good example. He took a public stand for God. And I think that today that that is one of the things that's probably needed as much as anything else is to take a public stand for God on the part of God's people. And we need to take a public stand today in the office where you work, in the shop where you work, in your social gathering. We need today to take a stand for God. Now, I'm going to talk next time about the spiritual movement that we have witnessed in the past few months. I have been overwhelmed by it, and I want to talk about it. But one of the things that's characterized it is that those that have come to Christ, they are out and out for him today. And that is the thing that the church needs to wake up to at this hour. Now, we are told something else about this man. He gave an invitation to others to come and worship God. Now, I pass over so many of the wonderful things that he did. And come to chapter 30, verse 1. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Now, his father carried on warfare against the northern kingdom, and they took them captive. You might think that Hezekiah would become king with a spirit of vengeance in his heart, a spirit of getting even. But notice, he opens up the temple of God, restores the worship, and gives a public testimony. Now he sends an invitation up to the northern kingdom. He said, you join us in worshiping God. What a marvelous, wonderful thing this is. And there is a return, you see, to the word of God, which I think is very tremendous here. For instance, in verse 15 and 16, we're told, Then they kill the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed, sanctified themselves, and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. Now, you see what's happening They're returning back to the Word of God. Oh, how we need that today, and we're beginning to see it. They read the Word of God. They returned to the Word of God. They realized it in their lives, and they were hearing and doing it. May I say to you that I probably sound like a square today, but there are things taking place even in our day, and we're going to talk about that next time in connection with this tremendous revival that took place in the days of Hezekiah in the long ago. So until next time, and at this same time and same place, I hope we'll meet together. Amazing turn of events. As we've seen over and over, the key to true revival is a return to the Word of God. You know, Martin Luther once said, In truth, you cannot read too much in Scripture, and what you read, you cannot read too carefully. And what you read carefully, you cannot understand too well. And what you understand well, you cannot teach too well. And what you teach well, you cannot live too well. Therefore, dear sirs, pray, read, study, be diligent. Now, while that's a bit of a tongue twister, those are really great words to live by, aren't they? That's why we're glad to have you join us each day on Through the Bible as we hop aboard the Bible bus and then systematically make our way through each book and chapter of God's Word. To help you get the most out of each day, 
be sure to visit us at ttb.org and sign up for our mailing list so that you can receive our bookmark with the reading schedule. You know, so many listeners tell us that reading ahead and then praying over the chapters that we study each day really makes a big difference in their comprehension and understanding of what we're learning. So again, the address to sign up for the mailing list is ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you call us, be sure to tell us where you hear through the Bible, knowing the name of your radio station or if you listen online or through an app. It really helps us to be good stewards of the resources provided by faithful friends like you. Tomorrow, we'll see the full effects of Hezekiah's leadership that brought a great revival to his people. So be sure to hop aboard the Bible bus and, as always, invite a friend to join you. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.